I want, without too much nuance and niceness, to give you my best effort to free you up from the shackles that hold you back. I can qualify all of what I'm about to say by saying we should not be bullies, we should not be too aggressive, we should not be quarrelsome. Yes, go read Ben Dunson's article. It's all in there. In fact, better yet, go read your Bible, cover to cover. You can get all of that. I'm not aiming to do that. I am aiming to destroy winsomeness. It's pulling it. This is what this is tonight. When you get on the football field or you're in a war, you have to embrace the reality. You're in it. Your opponent wants to destroy you. So what are you going to do? Friends, we're in a war. Souls hang in the balance. And the time for trying to reason with the truly winsome has passed. They've made their peace with the enemy. And I want to give you permission to preach like your grandfather. My grandfather was an Assemblies of God preacher down in Texas. They loved revival. Revival was their thing. In fact, when I talked to my grandma when I would go visit her, the first thing she would always ask was, what's your message? And I was like, I don't know what's happening right now. What do you mean my message? I preach about Jesus. What's your message? What's your, because in the revival type cultures, maybe you grew up in that, you have kind of a, a stump speech, so to speak, a, a, a sermon you give at revivals that's supposed to get people saved. And what I loved about the older generation of preachers, they weren't afraid to pound the pulpit, to raise their voice, and to call out sin. And I want more of that. I want to see more of that. Why? Because it's the faithful way to exposit the word of God. Enough of this playing footsie with the enemy. Winsome has become a concept which absolutely guts the scriptures and neuters the pulpit. When winsomeness is the standard for preaching and ministry, compromise is sure to follow. It diminishes the authority of God's word and misrepresents the moral landscape of God's word. J.D. Greer is a great example. He says homosexuality doesn't send you to hell because heterosexuality doesn't send you to heaven. Very clever. Very clever to avoid the issue. We all know that's not what's going on. Like, we all can see plainly what needs to be said in that moment. But he keeps wanting to be winsome. Or, according to the truly winsome, what are we to do with Elijah mocking the false gods, with Ezekiel comparing the wickedness of people lusting after horse genitalia, with David going to war and beheading Goliath, with the sarcasm of Paul in 2 Corinthians, with the harsh words he had for those who had wandered from the faith and handing them over to Satan, or saying people who love circumcision so, so much should go cut the whole thing off. What are we to do with that? To reference Duns Ben Dunson's article again. This is how Jesus spoke. Jesus refers to hardened opponents within the leadership of Israel as hypocrites, false prophets, ravenous wolves, workers of lawlessness. He tells the disciples to shake off the dust from your feet with regard to the villages that reject them as a sign of their condemnation. He is, his very coming necessarily produces sharp divisions between those who believe in him and those who don't. He refers to the current generation as this, an evil and adulterous generation. He calls Peter Satan, Herod a fox, and the scribes of the Pharisees blind guides, serpents, and a brood of vipers. Paul calls those attempting to persuade the Philippian believers to be circumcised dogs and evildoers, whose God is their belly and glory in their shame. He cites a Cretan poet describing the inhabitants of Crete as always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, adding laconically, <laughs> laconically, this testimony is true, before describing them in their unbelief as detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. What are the truly ones that suggest we would do with such examples in the Bible? Nothing. Nothing. Ignore it. You're not supposed to do that. To address one of their favorite parlor tricks, again, the third way approach, it's a method of engagement that cannot be consistently maintained and applied. It's easily logically disproven as a rhetorical strategy just by doing a reductio ad absurdum where you take it to its logical conclusion according to the third wayest. There would be no good side to choose in the Civil War, in a Communist Revolution, in World War II. It's always a third way all the way down. The third way approach is inherently pacifistic and Anabaptist. It is trying to pacify and find a way forward between two opposing forces. But the problem is, we need peacemakers today. Christ called us to be peacemakers. And the third way approach is false peacemaking. It's worldly compromise. They can cloak it in all sorts of philosophical language they want to, using fancy words like diagonalization, but it is what it is. Cowardice. Speak clearly. It turns history into bad guys versus bad guys. There's never been a good guy in history. Everyone in history is wrong, and we're all right, because we can see better than them. It makes Christians think that they're better than everyone who came before them. 
It is extremely arrogant. It's incredibly frustrating to talk with somebody who's bought into the third layer rhetorical strategy as a comprehensive worldview for how they navigate life. Because it functions like that parable of the elephant. You ever hear about this parable of the elephant? In a place like Rome, we hear a lot where you've got blind people coming up to an elephant trying to discern what the animal is. So you got one guy feels the, the uh, leg, and he's like, it's a tree trunk. And I got another guy feels the tail. It's, it's a whip. Another guy feels the ear. It's like a palm, or a palm tree, palm branch. And another guy feels the trunk, and it's like, it's a hose. And all of them are getting the truth, right? And of course, the, the counter to that is like, yeah, it, because you're claiming to know the truth. You're the one who sees everything. And that's what the third way is to do. They claim to be all-knowing. It functions Gnostically as if they can clearly see that everyone else is wrong and they're right. It typically creates false dilemmas. You've got conservatives are greedy, and liberals are socialism, so neither are good, so we've got to pick one. And it just makes every issue into two ditches. Doesn't allow for nuance, which is exactly the talent they claim to possess. It creates false equivalences between two opposing sides. The question isn't whether all choices are bad. That's not insightful or helpful. We live in a fallen world. Of course there are no perfect choices besides Jesus Christ. You will make bad choices, and oftentimes, especially as a pastor, you experience this, you have to make a choice relationally, and both are gonna result in bad things or consequences that you would rather not endure. We assume different sides have bad parts, but it incapacitates Christians and churches from speaking truthfully about moral reasoning today. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and share with a friend. Truth matters.